the word education. As time passes, what really counts is what you can remember. Take this piece of paper and please stand up. With our earplugs? Just all you need are the lyrics. <coughs> We will begin, first of all, marching. We're going to chime in unison, just like they did. We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. No dark sarcasm in the classroom. Teachers, leave them kids alone. Hey, teachers, leave them kids alone. All in all, it's just a another brick in the wall. All in all, you're just a another brick in the wall. One line about that experience. Now, just one line of practicing propaganda, because that was the endeavor, to practice propaganda, not just talk about it. Repeat after me. Anika is the area of a rectangle. We don't need no thought control. his teaching method, his whole way of, of, of teaching made me realize that I had never had a good teacher before and that I wasn't really engaged in quality education. It was almost, how long can this go on? It was almost like a secret. You didn't want the administration to find out how wonderful these classes are because they take it away from you. Every time we came to class, it was a new adventure. We had no idea where we were going to be taken to. We had no clue. It's like a, a, a slumber party, you know, sooner or later the parents are going to knock on the door and say, OK, that's it, enough. Like, everyone pipe down, it's done. I mean, it was clear that the class was unorthodox. And I was wondering, I mean, I'm sure everyone was wondering, you know, how does this guy have his job? <laughs> how is he able to teach in the McGill environment? I think when, everyone, when everyone's there, they're kind of like, you know, this is unlike anything I've taken. How can this be? I've got a lot of anxieties about education, actually, but, but Norman Cornett was, was a type of education that I know is right, for sure. He practices education in class. So students don't sit there like, you know, empty vessels that need to be filled up with information by the teacher. No, they come full and they go out even fuller. Whoever said education should be a bore. <laughs> Now, um, oh, a few decades back, th there was a common expression in popular culture um, that you would read now and then. Everything you always wanted to know about sex but never dared ask. Well, that's sort of the analogy for this course. This course, and specifically Mr. Jones' presence here, is everything you always wanted to know about jazz, but never dared ask. And as Mr. Jones and I discussed, the title of this course is The Soul and Soul Music. And he invites you to any questions you have as to the, um, religion, spirituality, gospel music, the spirituals, uh, which have informed his music, his compositions, 
and his many recordings, particularly with the Just In Time label. These two are fair game today. I usually shop around at the beginning of the, um, at the, beginning of the semester, it's trying out many different courses from different uh, faculties and departments. And I tried it out and felt it was an interesting pedagogical style, something that I could uh, learn something from. And the issues that we were speaking of, you know, um, well, we were talking about the sacred, but investigating that in different areas of life, art, music, and politics. This is something that interested me, and uh, I felt that uh, though it was a little weird, I, uh, <laughs> I'd. I'd I, I, I'd try it. I'm a religious person. I come from a religious background, and I wanted to just, you know, open open up a bit more to learn more about other religions, to learn about other points of view, and um, I thought that a, a minor in world religions was was how to do that, and it, it indeed was. It was some of the most formative and and uh, challenging courses that I took at McGill, and many of those were were from Dr. Cornett. We'll always begin with making up a sentence. And so if you'll take out a piece of paper, we encourage you to go into recycling bins, do your bag person gig, uh, and get as much paper that people are going to toss or have tossed and bring it with you. You will need reams of it. We'll be writing what I call reflections in a stream of consciousness vein. We don't want you to worry about grammar, syntax, also known as sentence structure, Spelling, you can do whatever you want, literally. Think what you want, write what you want, say what you want. There is no right and wrong, true and false, bad and good. All of it's open. This is open learning. Um, and so we're not looking for what the prof thinks is right. And remember, you're not graded on this. So you can say what you want. The method of teaching is that we would engage in an artistic, an, in a piece of art um, or a piece of news, a piece of information through a really large variety of ways. So Dr. Cornette would have us looking at a uh, painting when we were wearing earplugs or close our eyes and listen to a piece of music. And after we had finished experiencing it, we would write, write it down and we would reflect. We have a lot to get done. So I'll ask you all to uh, please put on your blindfolds. <laughs> okay, folks. Uh, now we're going to turn out all the lights here in a moment. So make sure you're safe. <laughs> you're not going to trip over anything. Um, and everybody has their blindfolds? Blessed are those who have believed and not seen, because you won't be seeing. <laughs> Just a second, and I'll ask Ms. Obama someone to help us with the lights here. OK, we all got them? If we could have absolute silence, please, folks. OK. of it is kind of uh, field visits so um, once we would look at someone's paintings in class and experience them through a bunch of different ways uh, that were all interesting and different we'd reflect then we'd eventually go and experience that art in its location so we'd go to a vernissage or an art gallery or um, one of the museums and see and interact with that art in the space and it was always really interesting to see you know, 50 students run around with a piece of paper and a pen sitting on the floor, writing on the walls, 
taking photos in the art gallery. I think a lot of people who were <laughs> in those places at that time thought it was pretty bizarre, but what came out of it was really exciting. We did everything from concerts to dance to theater to watching film screenings. about or done research about palliative care and then uh, and and the next day we would go to see um, an exhibition in the gallery and they would have nothing to do with each other but because you know he had made this do the research before about the palliative care I had you know my mind was sort of on you know around that and when I I went to see the the exhibition. I was all confused because I didn't know what why we were there, but it was for a completely different experience. We would meet the artist much later in the semester, and it put things in. It, it really confused us sometimes because we had no clue where he was taking us and why. But then it made the adventures so much better so much better. We would have to reflect on everything we did, what be it reading or documentary what, viewing or the museum, we'd have to reflect. And, and he would say, people would say, what, what do you want us to write? You know, kids, are, the students are so not used to, you know, what do you want from us? He'd say, just tell, you know, what do you want to tell it? I just wanted to know if you wanted whole sentences or just words, just like a big long list of anything. words. Anything, just let your mind run. Does that chapter say something to you? What do you want to tell it? What would you like to tell the author? Would you like to tell the author off? You have the freedom. Dialogue with it, answer it, question it, challenge it, accept it, reject it, answer, dialogue with that medium. Nobody will ever know who wrote this. And that allows us the freedom to speak our minds to find our own words, to appropriate ideas. It's a clean slate. And you're going to write on it whatever you want. And that's as valid as what the person next to you writes. Because a lot of this is about validating our own convictions and having no fear to take a stand in the public domain for what we believe. We suffer no illusions that we're all going to believe the same or s speak the same. And you might have noticed it's propaganda constitutes, PC, political correctness. We should like to banish it during March Madness so that we learn that the only answer that really counts is an honest answer. Since when, ladies and gentlemen, do we divorce the right answer from an honest answer. The rest is academic BS. So, other questions? I enjoyed my time with uh, Professor Kernet. I think he understood what we learned about each other in classes was as important as regurgitating information, which is what a lot of my time at McGill was, was learning stuff by rote, and then in three hours at the end of the semester putting it out. And uh, you find a lot of people who are very good at that, academically very gifted and very talented at that, but weren't very aware of the world outside the little field of concentration, where there was biochemistry or neurology or political science. They could, they could discuss those subjects very well and very intricately, but they were unable, they didn't have a sense of self. I think Dr. Cornette taught us about the sense of self. I love the idea of one generation teaching another. I want to believe that the human experience is the same as the years go by. While circumstances may change, as human beings, we always care about the same things. 
we would be writing older whatever I. came to our mind right away. We're not worrying about sentence structure. Maybe if you didn't have some words coming to your head right away, you could doodle on the piece of paper, you could just draw. Um, and so eventually I was able to learn a kind of stream of consciousness writing. So that is something that I've taken away from the course. It's the way I write now when I write emails or letters to friends, it's the way I write in my journal. And that raw reaction to the art or to the information or to the situation is just so incredible when it's presented to the people who come into the class. Piece number one, chaos, unplug, non-traditional, raw, emotional. Piece number two, love. You could really feel how much he loves this piece or the meaning behind it as he made love to his cello. Alone. <laughs> University just did not really offer me that kind of learning in any other classroom. I learned a lot about myself through reflecting about others. Upon hearing this comment, I understood that she watches the news and feels the same pain as I do when watching the same news item. We watch the same reporting, and she feels it is anti-Palestinian, while I see it as anti-Israeli. At most universities in general, I, I assume, but I, my own experiences at McGill, is that um, it's, you know, they, they celebrate the authority of reason, you know, and logic, and a paper that I turn in, that I work hard on, I turn into a um, professor, is graded only on the extent of its rational aesthetic, its logical symmetry, kind of, you know, that you have a thesis and, and you can prove it, and you, it's, you know, it's, it fits within the exact format of a thesis paper, and, and, and everything, you know, it's all proven rationally. How it affected me is, totally irrelevant to the final product. The more you put in about how it makes you feel or how it affects you as a person, the less quality it has according to the university standards. Dr. Cornette was the first teacher that I had that encouraged his students to find our individual voices and to look ourselves in the faces and answer the question, who am I? What do I think about certain issues and why. And that's the thing, like it's very easy to be interested academically in anything. And I could be interested in the plight of women academically and discuss the truth the back and forth and the different waves of feminism and we can talk about that. But to care is a different thing. To actually care about how it's going and to, to involve yourself that was the difference between Cornette and the thousand things. I mean, at McGill, I studied everything from, from Plato to, to um, black nationalism to, I, I study, you study everything. Do you care about any of it? I don't think you're required to. You're not required to at all. He captures people's heart and he kept, ke captured their intellectual engagement. Young or old or middle age, it's not important. He brings issues to the table that people are involved in. People want to learn. People want to discuss. People want to dialogue. People want to understand. He is an ultimate teacher. Theology, according to what I know of Professor Rapkin, actually in what I know about theology in general, Jewish theology in particular, does not give a good answer to reality in which people say we don't want to be religious. It does not have an answer. And to some extent, to blame everything on Zionism is a very, let's say, a shortcut, easy shortcut out from the seriousness of the problem. Although I do agree that- You would bring in a whole panel of people, mostly professionals, to come and dialogue with us and dialogue amongst themselves and that we would all dialogue together about the issues. This is when it like really came to life. And the people would come in, you know, the people who have been there, the people who have the stories, the people who have the emotions, the people who have the childhoods. I don't understand why, why we don't, we can't just give up and, 
and just approach the table with the, with the belief in God as opposed to belief in power and interest and territory. I don't understand it. Religion, I find, is, is subjective. It's very subjective. It's shrouded in mystery. And, and it's difficult not just to grade the courses for religious study, but religion, the subject itself, has a lot of mystery, has a lot of uncertainty. It's because of that uncertainty, which I think keeps religion, keeps curiosity, keeps it going. And I think it's, it's almost uh, you know, paradoxical how he used very unconventional ways of teaching religion but in doing so taught us the disciplines which make all religious you know scholarship um, uh, valuable and that is respect for primary sources going to the going to people who might not agree with you going to people who don't have the same opinions that you do on a certain subject but listening to them and realizing hey at the end of the day these are just human beings these are you know and to and to understand where they're coming from and, and that's, I think, what a good religious scholar should do. In addition to that, he, 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 he argues that the classroom should be a community because he believed that education goes, it's a communal project. That is, it is based on dialogue. So he says, for example, my student would have, would choose their own names in my class. <laughs> so you see, all these ideas are so incredible. And that's still how he refers to me today. He doesn't call me Jesse, Mr. Gutman, anything like that. He calls me Planting Roots, which was the name that I chose for myself. First semester I was Resolute, and second semester I was Big Papa. Unintentional matchmaker, Woodstock, Soprano Gal, did you still have your hand up? Lieutenant Dan. Infinite Wonder. Uh, vegetable Lasagna. Right. Um. <laughs> Problem Child. Atrocious. Secret Garden. Jacko Jonestown. Spice Spears. Tragically Gabriel. Jefferson Cake. Okay, the gift of love over there in Little Mermaid had a question. I'm gonna ask a question that I'm sure none of you are. Little Mermaid? <laughs> he is the only prof after three years at McGill that still knows my name and that I talk to on the phone. It's very rare. I've never Especially at McGill, where your class, and in my major, political science and international development, it's classes that are 350 people, and you try to speak to the prof, but is he really going to remember, you know? Whereas Dr. Cornette, he makes the effort and gets to know each and every one, and knows personal details about everybody. So he's able to engage you and inspire you in a very personal, unique level. To all my professors, I am 260-184-665. To Dr. Cornette, I'm Jason Martin, majoring in economics from Montreal. My father's an auctioneer, I have a brother and sister. Uh, my mother works with my father, like he knows. And that's because through the various reflections, he's learned that about me. And it, it means something to me that I'm not a, a number. I'm a student, I'm a person, I'm a human being. If you learn from them, they will teach you and they will, teach, they will be taught by you. So it's a, it's a dialogical approach. And that's exactly how he calls his work dialogical sessions. It is true. Our humanity is based on dialogue. And if we do that, we can go far to wonderful places. And I think that each session that I was there, and as a professor, I felt that I learned so much. I'm sure that the student, I told him more than once, I wish I had a professor like you when I was a student. Norman is a character in some way. Uh a very really sort of special person, yeah. I mean, an American Protestant who comes and uh, falls in love with a Catholic, a conservative Catholic political figure. I mean, it's very interesting, yeah. It took him 10 years or so to write this dissertation. He had thousands of pages at first and had to reduce it. He read the entire archives of Lina Gru. He read all the letters. I was present at the defense. Normally at McGill, at the defense, very few people come, maybe one or two students. But in his case, there were quite a few people there from the institute, uh, the archives of Lina Gru. At the beginning of your defense, you have about 20 minutes to present 
what you have done to the five professors around the table uh, to tell you why you chose the topic and what method you use and what insights you gained. And he used these five, uh, these 20 minutes by turning to the audience and telling them about his own arrival in Quebec from the United States, uh, where he was saddened by the contempt for black people. And when he arrived in Quebec, he was saddened by the contempt for French Canadians. And therefore, he became deeply involved in French Canadian literature and discovered uh, Gou and had so much sympathy because he was a great defender of uh, the French Canadian identity. And we all were a bit amazed at this because this is not normally the way um, uh, theses are defended at McGill. In 87, he started studying at McGill. He took a church history course with Dr. Edward Fershett, who encouraged him to jump the masters and go straight to his doctorate, which he did. And he realized that that's what he wanted to do, was to be a university professor at that point. He started out lecturing and giving exams, and I just, I remember how seeing him slave over lecture notes and try to get all the material he wanted to teach. And he would always have more than he needed. But it was so exhausting to watch him prepare. And one year he had the idea of teaching soul and soul music with the jazz festival. He realized how much he loved music. I think with Norm, one thing that attracted me initially to him was his desire to learn. And I would almost call it an addiction. <laughs> he, he just can't stop learning. He never taught one course the same way ever. And that's why this style of teaching for him was so valuable because he was learning with the students every time he taught. courses he taught, I looked at him and I said, you are having so much fun, aren't you? And he said, so much, I've never had so much more fun in my life. summertime course was incredible. Uh, it was called Soul and Soul, The Soul and Soul Music. It was focusing on the Montreal Jazz Festival. Dr. Cornette, with his amazing contacts across the music scene and the music world, was able to bring in all these artists to the classroom after we had experienced them in a variety of ways. Something that I would have never expected to happen at school. Oh, and it's a festival. Oh, and it's a 
when I moved here, you know, Dr. Cornett helped me find um, meaning in Montreal, where I am. Um, it's now home. Uh, a lot of the reason is because he pointed out what makes Montreal unique historically. I feel more connected to this place. And also just, you know, to learn more about, you know, Jewish people, you know, Muslims, all sorts of uh, different cultures. And, and uh, this is what makes Montreal and, and Canada, I believe, great. And, and, that's, and that's what his course has opened me up to. This is the thing about the class. And we have things called bird courses, courses you take to get a name. And a lot of people had the misconception that Cornette's classes were a bird course because it was 80, 90% participation. Okay, you had to do, and but participation, there was a lot of participation. I, yet we read, I did more work for Cornette's classes than I did for any of my others. I mean, we read books, we watched, for example, we watched the documentary and we would do pages and pages and pages of like reflections and would read books. I mean, at the end I was like, it's so much work that it's not worth it. You can't take it as a bird course. It did demand a lot of my time, but it, I mean, it was just once you got into it and you knew what, what it was about, you're like, this is so worth it. You have to, uh, you have to do it. Like it's, it's uh, you know, it's, we did it with, uh, with, with great joy. <laughs> my first semester, someone counted. I believe it was something like over 101 reflections we wrote. I mean, some people write like three page essays while others write a, a paragraph, you know? And it's up to the individual to decide what they want to write and how much they want to express or what they have to express. He had read my entire essay in, at this panel and it was so intimidating. He never says our name, but he'll read our work. And he read the entire thing and then he came up to me afterwards and he said, Rosanna, what are you doing with your life? And I was like, I don't know. And he said, whatever you do, keep writing, keep writing. I've never actually seen the inside of his office. I think because he, he claimed it was too dirty, full of these papers that he says he collects. So, but that wasn't a problem. He's actually sat outside his office in a chair, swivel, and he uh, had a box and he just collected reflections that way. And sometimes he'd have a conversation with you, you know, and his phone would actually be outside of his office with him, right next to the bathroom, which he often uh, made light of. When Dr. Cornett brings in the people who have made the art or made the film or made the discussion, the dialogue uh, on that subject, they're not really aware of what's about to happen. So when that person comes to class and Dr. Cornett just reads out these reactions uninhibited, um, it, it's really amazing. And I have heard from a lot of artists themselves say that it's something that they have never experienced in their entire life. Another um, creative thinker wrote this, and they entitled your, your performance, Don't Be Proud of Who You Are. I really don't know what to say. I feel like I should be shouting, Bravo! Obliged to applaud the efforts of an artist who gave away so much. I feel this is what I should do, but I don't want to. This. I did not get. And even if that's not the point, there was no pleasure afforded to me in this performance. It was painful to watch. And there was a smell, a sterile smell of cleansing, kind of, that gave me a feeling of deliriousness. This is raw emotion, this is, uh, people telling it as they as it is and Dr. Cornette doesn't hold that back. I think it's really amazing for an artist to be able to hear that because they don't get a chance normally. Self-loathing and a stoic refusal of history. It's an exercise in honesty maybe of our, our own opinions. You write down something on a piece of paper thinking that it's just between your mind and the paper and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you realize it's being shared with everybody, but in complete, it's completely anonymous. So I think it's, it's interesting. You get to see the whole like range of perspectives that exists out there. And that same topic, people can think completely different things about. One of the reasons for which I accepted this invitation, contrary to many invitations, I do accept or other I can't accept, was that I have nothing to prepare. <laughs> <laughs>
I was curious as to for how long have you been practicing and how did you develop this teaching method? I did 15 years continuous university education. And I started out normal. You'll have to take that by faith, Charlie. Uh, with quizzes, midterms, finals, exams, uh, term papers, essays, the whole nine yards. I'm a historian by training. Um, but in religious studies. Um, and <clears throat> I had classes of two or three or four or five people, which is great in one sense. But if you want to make a difference, how can you impact the most people for the best good? So I started to open up my understanding of religion and of education. And so then the courses got bigger, but something didn't change. As long as I employed the, um, the usual suspects of quizzes, midterms, finals, and exams, I knew I had very capable people sitting as you are right now. Intelligent, articulate, I knew they were. But when you have a 21-year-old male student who's in their last year come to your desk and literally have a nervous breakdown, I mean literally, to the point that you have to call an ambulance, you say to yourself, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this again and again. I would see people absolutely paralyzed, just in agony. Then you have to ask yourself, what's going on campus? Universities across North America have seen 50 to 100% increase of the number of students that they've seen who are struggling. At McGill, the number of students who came for help went up from about 400 students in the mid-80s to over 2,300 students by the year 2007. Every year, the number of people who come for help and seem to be suffering seems to go up a lot. One sees depression, struggled with alienation, and suicide in all different age groups. In university students, by the age of 23, that's often an age where most of their peers would have graduated. But when they reach that point where they see other people succeeding in life and they're falling further and further behind, that may be a point where they're at high risk. <laughs> Everybody's capable of feeling inspired. Everybody's capable of connecting with values, with ideas that spark their creativity. You challenge people. You challenge people within an environment that is humanistic and people will flourish. You restrain people. You expect them to turn in a paper that looks exactly like this. You know, a certain way, follow the guidelines with no creativity. And this is what, people, what students experience all the time. If they're just churning out papers, trying to get their A's, following certain set patterns. And they're turning out so many they aren't even learning from them. It's one, then the other, then the other. No particular creativity, but you're functioning as best you can to get high marks if you can. That's not learning. That's not learning about the world. It's not learning about yourself. You know, you can't change the institution, but I'm an individual who has moral volition. I have ethical, moral responsibility to do what I can to make the classroom a better learning environment. So, that's what led to this. Does that give you an answer? Yeah, okay. Now, were there other questions? There is amazing hope in the young people in what they want. But we need to let the people who have a stronger humanistic voice speak out and take a place in our society. I'm actually an observer of the religious mind myself. And I find it really discouraging to hear you say that you don't think there's going to be a relationship between the two sides. Um, theologically speaking and, and secularly speaking that there's no relationship because as far as I'm concerned religion seeks um, an alignment and a unification of the body, mind, and spirit and when you live in the world without spirit or when you deny spirit or you resist spirit that every act of move that you make 
is going to be destructive because it is going to move away from spirit. Where when you live in a world where you listen to spirit, you're going to be responsible and that it will be guided and that it will be a book then for all of humanity and not just for one individual or one side or another side. I think that uh, the opposition to Zionism that my book is about uh, concern, has concerned people who were uh, on the some people call them ultra-Orthodox, I don't like the term, but I call them Haredian book, but that's what they call themselves. The whole issue that Dr. Kurnat inadvertently, I think, touched, this Israel, Zionism, Jews, is an issue which is very different from any other, I think, in our society today. There is no other issue on which you can lose friends. You can defend pedophilia, you can do anything you want, but to criticize Israel saying that perhaps it wasn't a good idea to create it. Perhaps it said, look how much violence it has caused for 60 years. Just to say these things very often makes you completely untouchable in our society. I think Dr. Kenev does not impose his views. Actually, I don't know what his views on the subject are. We've talked quite a bit before my appearances and after. I think he wants students to think and uh, and this is what I've been trying to do with my students, to make them think, to make them uh, uh, find truth among very different opinions. I'm a religious Jew, but I call myself a secular Zionist for the following reason. Too often, religion is, is, is used incorrectly by people in the Middle East and all over the world. And, and I think religion and nationalism is a very dangerous mix. And I think we've missed an opportunity at times in Israel to discuss how dangerous that mix can be. But I would also say the following. I would prefer to see, the problem with religion in Israel, I, that I, the way I see it, is that too often the religious parties in the Israeli Knesset are there, and they seem to be concerned only with guarding their own prerogatives, guaranteeing funding for their own institutions, and guaranteeing success for their own legislation, rather than taking a, more, a broader outlook to think about how to do exactly what you talked about, taking religion, the principles of Judaism, and, 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 and raise and elevate the entire conversation about the future of Israel and to, and to talk about how we can use some really old ancient Israeli uh, Jewish principles and how to trans, translate them into solving modern problems. And, and, and too often that's not done because there's this Knesset mentality that everyone's out there just for themselves and, and everyone's out there guarding their, their, their own little piece of the turf rather than looking at, at, at it in a broader way. And I think that's, that's part of the problem in Israel. In this class we did touch up upon a lot of subjects and we discussed, you know, controversial topics and other regular topics. We have a very multicultural world. There's politics, there's economics, there's arts, there's this and that. And in one class you go through all of this. So you come out of it and you've learned a great deal and you've experienced a great deal. This is Talk About 11 and you might notice my shoes today. Those that I wore the first day in Greenbow County because remember, in Forrest Gump, you learn a lot about someone through their shoes, where they've been. Talk about one, Judaism and anti-Zionism. Talk about two, the relationship between music and medicine through Mr. Berger's gift. Talk about three and four on the native peoples of Canada. Talk about five, Gideon's Blues and Black History Month. Talk about six, art with Professor Francois Morelli. Talk about seven, dealing with Cambodia. Talk about eight, the truth about death and dying with Rui and Mazzaro. Talk about nine, the media and genocide. Talk about 10, with the Right Honorable Paul Martin. Talk about 11, with Dr. Harry Rosen. This is where our feet have taken us, and we'd like to talk with you about the remaining path ahead. I see him as sort of this subaltern kind of academic because he has managed to exist for a really long time in this very stringent, very conservative, very specific world of academia, but he's not concerned with publishing all the time. He's not concerned with tenure. He's not concerned with the kind of rat race that exists also in the world of professors. And I think 
McGill University is a very conservative organization that just couldn't handle the way that he ran his courses. What's happened? Well, I was right to be worried. I've been dismissed. Why? What reason did they give? None at all. Just an official call. Services no longer required. I'm never to go to the school anymore. They must give you a reason, make them tell you why, go to the school and oh, ask. I can't do that. Anyway, who knows what they may have said about me to the children? Strange. I wonder what you said that made the analyst. Don't you have any idea? There must be something you said or did. Oh, I never did get on well with the staff. They disapprove of me. I don't always stick to the timetable. Well, we have fun in my classes and they don't like that. After 15 years of teaching, Dr. Cornett was dismayed to learn that his contract was not renewed for the upcoming semester. The former dean, the last day he was dean, I received a note from him. Empty your desk, remove all your personal effects from the building, you're not coming back, you're not teaching. No reason given. I've also asked in writing and sent by courier um, that they provide an explanation for what is taking place. I've never received that. I've done this three times. Then, um, two weeks ago, tomorrow, uh, Professor Julius Gray, a lawyer, uh, had, already, had sent, two weeks ago tomorrow, to both the new dean and to the principal of McGill University a letter to the same effect has received no response whatsoever. My problem with the whole story is not the legalities, but the morality. It seems to me that Professor Cornett had a course which was very popular, uh, which was appreciated by students. I myself participated in it on a number of occasions, and it was very good, it was interesting. Um, He's been there for 15 years. Admittedly, he was not uh, very diligent with his paperwork, and so he didn't get tenure and so on. But then after 15 years, is the university such a jungle that a man can be turned out without comment, without explanation? Uh, if that is the case, then it simply reflects the, the, what I call the, uh, the extreme cruelty of our market society. I think we have to get away from that. We have to get away from the idea that there is no protection whatsoever other than a strict form of tenure. Uh, so I would like to see if academics stand up for those who do not belong to the privileged tenured caste. And it has nothing to do with one university or another. They're all the same. There is a, uh, a little bit of a jungle that's beginning to form, especially with respect to those who are not at the very top. I don't know what to say. It was, it was cowardly the way they went about it. Um, it lacked ethics, it lacked moral, it lacked class. I didn't go to my graduation, by the way. I went to pick up my degree. Not just because of Cornette, because a lot of other issues, a lot of disillusionment. I wrote an article about Cornette in the newspaper and I said, McGill will never see a dime from me. I donated $25, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have given them. Yeah, but when I'm a rich man, McGill, I'm not giving them anything. It was shameful. The whole affair was shameful. That was one of the reasons why I did decide to, to leave McGill. Um, I was worried that my education was making all these people think more and more alike and um, like I said, very impersonal and almost just like an education. It was an indoctrination. A, a lecturer gets up and you, they tell you what to think and what to write. And Norman Cornett told us what we already knew. That's what he taught us. He taught us how to learn about ourselves and how to respect our things, our own knowledge and, and learn about ourselves. And he didn't he didn't say a word, like he didn't ever lecture, but I learned the most in that class. And yet 
they fired him for some reason. I don't know why, but so I decided that maybe another school was, was better for me. Well, uh, I was uh, largely uncomprehending. Uh, uh, great loss. Great loss to the institution, I would think. But uh, uh, obviously, he, he was not run of the mill. I can understand that uh, he wouldn't fit into a fixed curriculum because this teaching was one of awakening. And the awakening was not uh, governed by some previously laid down program. It was according to, well, largely the events of the day in a broad sense, the issues before society. It was a training of the mind, and of the intellect, and of the uh, moral sense. I wrote an article with a friend concerning Dr. Cornet at the McGill Daily. And that's something I would have never been able to do earlier before. You know, you, you talk about something, you, you say, oh, that's a sad story, they're letting him go. But a lot of people are able to say something but not do something about it. And I think through him, through his inspiration, now I'm able to actually say this is unjust. What is happening to Dr. Cornet is unjust. Dr. Cornet definitely empowered me to uh, to go and fight. What we did is we got a petition, and we got lots of students to sign the petition. We had people write letters, former students write in from all over the world, literally all over the world, from New Zealand, we had some from India, South Africa, all over Europe, students in Canada and the US. And they wrote in little testimonials about how amazing the professor was, about how amazing the class was. One mother wrote that her student was on the verge of dropping out of school. And it was Dr. Cornett's class that infused her, that re-infused her with, with the strength and with the optimism and with, the, um, with confidence in her own abilities to continue. Everybody that's ever taken his class, even from years ago, if, you know, I've run into a couple people on the street and as soon as they hear about this, they're, they give me their contact and say, add me to the email list. I want to know what's going on, if there's anything I can do. People are very supportive of him. I'm paying for an education. I want a justification why a professor who I enjoy his classes, why a course that I enjoy is being taken away. And I think the, the university has to stand up for that and say, fine, if they have a justifiable reason, hey, I'm all for it, but give it to me. I want to hear it. They won't even talk to Dr. Cornette, as you probably know. Like he'll go into the building and they don't talk to him at all. You know, the firing of Cornette uh, uh, was mentioned by several people in the media. And some colleagues of Dr. Cornette protested his firing. And one of these letters appeared in Le Devoir, and there was a response from McGill that made me feel a bit nostalgic because it reminded me of the Pravda. He also had articles in the Pravda that says, we are the best because we are the best and we are very good. And that pretty much was the summary of the response from McGill. It never addressed the issue why the person was fired. It said that McGill is loyal to its principles of freedom of speech and so on, but it never addressed the issue. When this happens, I become very suspicious. It is difficult. I think the hardest thing for us as a family is to see the lack of respect in the way he's being treated for doing something so good. We're all McGill graduates. And it's hard for us to see McGill doing this. But we've made a decision as a family, and this is largely due to Norm, to not discuss it very much at home, but to really um, focus on the positive and enjoy one another. Our grandson helps us do that. 
He's a year old and he just, just he celebrates life constantly. He makes us all want to sing. But I do appreciate that because for many years, Norm getting his doctorate was so central to our family. And that was, it was too, too hard on the family. And Norm realizes that and said that we've got to go on living even if they're, they've taken my job away. These are difficult times for Dr. Cornett. He's at a complete loss without his teaching position. And at the same time, his wife Laura's cancer, which had been in remission, has suddenly reappeared. Discouraged, he turns to the legal system to try and get his position back. You understand that what we have is a negotiating session. McGill has made it very clear that they are not considering reinstatement. So that the only possible outcome can be either failure of the session or damages. If a settlement is reached, then that's the end of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, McGill will not be prepared to make a settlement. Nobody would. I would not, as a lawyer, tell somebody to make a settlement if there's any outstanding issues afterwards. If you make a settlement, you shake hands, you take whatever you get, and that's the end of the story. Uh, McGill's position is undoubtedly going to be we're not here to discuss anything other than money. I've been trying avidly uh, to get employment uh, with Concordia University, with Marianapolis. I can't, because of my age, I'm 57 going on 58, I can't find anything. And now since the end of April to have no contact um, in a classroom, because for me, the, the classroom became a theater of learning with no restrictions, no boundaries. And to have that theater shut down when that's been 15 years of my life, this is a lot to deal with at the same time. And I, I wanna make sure that I contain myself emotionally and therefore will rely on the counsel of uh, Professor Gray in this session. We'll see what we can do. The first round of negotiations takes place behind closed doors. Mr. Pierre Lamy from the Quebec Labour Board was there and he explained to them, to Maître Thibault and to Dean Aiken, and he gave an amount. And after a long time, he came back and he says, they're not even close to that. Not even anywhere near that. Um, and I said, well, they, and, and he, he told us, the reason they can't is because they don't have any money. I said, well, why don't they save all their money and let me teach and not waste a cent? I will teach and we'll forget everything. Well, he went back again and Pierre Lamy returned to the room. He says, under no circumstances. And they won't talk to you anymore now. It's too much money and they'll never allow you to teach. And they gave no reason. And they walked away. And that's it. And that's it. But it's never been about money for us. Ever. Ever, you know. It's about the future. And right now, Laura and I just can't see light at the end of the tunnel. We don't see hope. We're not sure we see much of a future medically. Uh, for Lori. I mean, where do you go after chemo? <laughs> And, and, and I know they can ante up and they can give her even harder chemo, but even the chemo she's got now takes a lot out of her. And they know very well that if they zap her with too much chemo, life isn't worth living anymore. So it's, that's what this is about. It's about hope and it's about fut having a future. Now I admit, as somebody who has faith on a good day, <laughs> um, you know, faith should see us through this. Um, that I should know that there's a lining behind, there's a silver lining behind every cloud and all that. It's just very difficult to see right now in the midst of the storm.
And I think that Norman Cornett says, life is not organized in line. And we need to bring to our student life as it is, a chaotic, sometimes very difficult, sometimes hardly manageable and confusing. That's what life is. And you have to make room for that. And sometimes making such room can walk on the toes of some people who are in position of authority because they need people to be in line. And when you break the line and when you say, no, there is no clear line, administration and managers don't like it. Norman is a man with strong convictions. And uh, in order to succeed, you have to adjust and play ball. And I think that he finds this probably more difficult. I very much respected the way he's gone through this. I, I'm not one to, uh, to confront or to fight things. I would just say goodbye and leave. But Norm has not retaliated. He's not sought revenge. He just doesn't understand why something so good would be maligned. But it, it helps him to hear from students how much it has changed their lives. There's one student he had who was in his front of his first jazz courses, and he called him last night and said, Dr. Cornett, I want you to know I'm teaching you, and I'm teaching like you. And that was really exciting for Norm. Mm -hmm. For example, in this piece, I'm going to play for you. It's probably from the first box suite. What do you think of the melody? Well, I ran into him the other day. He was coming out of a metro station. And um, he took me to this art show um, and was telling me about what he was doing, uh, writing about art and adrenals and such. And he said he was really, really busy and doing, he seemed to be doing really, really well. But when I think of him, I don't know, I just feel so sad because people gained so much from that man. People gained so much and they learned so much. And it's such a loss to lose him as an educator. There's actually a verse in the Bible that says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And you know, when this all started happening, three things came into my mind. What is good, what is just, and what is right? And I have to focus on those three priorities. What is good, what is just, what is right? And in the Civil Rights Movement, they had a song, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize. And to me, that's the prize to not give in to hate, but to keep my eyes on the good, the right, and the just. Six months after beginning negotiations, 
Dr. Cornet is called to appear at the Quebec Liber Court expecting a hearing where he would finally learn the reasons for his dismissal. Instead, he is told that only a financial settlement is on the table. Yet, he continues to believe he will teach again at McGill. So tell me, uh, how did it go? Um, I think the operative word uh, that Professor uh, Gray repeated and echoed by the mediator, Marie-André Lévesque, is realism. They said this is not a perfect world and the justice system is not perfect. And uh, they said, you should accept a settlement. Mm -hmm. And he was adamant. You're going to have to make a decision. Well, it's not a decision I can make alone. I mean, if we're up to me and I made it really clear to Marion Grebe and to Professor Gray, I will go on. That was my decision. I made it very, very quick. Professor Gray got close to angry when I said that. He really feels that you should just settle oh, that oh, again. Oh, he's, he's adamant. He's adamant. Under no circumstances is there any hope to teach at McGill. I thought, I really genuinely, genuinely at the very core of my being, I hoped McGill was a better, inst better institution, a bigger institution, a more, not tolerant, a more adventurous institution than it turned out to be. Um, I really wanted to come to McGill for a long time, from the age of about 14, 15. I had my sights set on McGill. I love the school. It's a fantastic place. So even when I offered the criticisms, it comes from someone who really, really, really wanted to come to this school and really wanted to study here. And I thought it would be, I thought it would be big enough to have a cornet, and it turned out they weren't. Personally, personally, I feel like I let him down a bit. Um, more than a bit. Um, and I know that it's, it's not my fault. I'm not to blame for him not teaching anymore, but at the same time, it was so real, and it is so real the lessons that he taught about, you know, about that if, if your will is strong enough and if, you, if it's right and just, then, then there's nothing that can stop you. When I studied law, uh, civil code and so forth, we just spoke about obligations, duties. There was very little about rights. And the common law was the same. But of course, if you have an obligation, the, the right will follow. But if you have a right and no obligation, you have nothing left. Gardens are a sign of hope. And if you don't take care of them, they won't keep blooming. Mm -hmm. This has been a hard week for chemo, but I've loved this summer because I've been able to work in the garden. This has really been an, a place for me to foster that hope in life. A real part of my healing journey is painting. It's like meditating. It helps me to focus on one thing and that's creating beauty. And it's learning to see the detail and yet the whole picture. At times, it's a form of prayer, too. I don't hear any other voices but the voice inside and the voice of love. And when I want to escape all the voices around me, this is where I come. My son has asked me to do one of a, a cottonwood tree in a desert, so that's gonna be my next big project. 
because cottonwoods go down very deep and it can look like the desert all around them and they can be flourishing. And that was very significant to him on his Grand Canyon trip recently. He saw a cottonwood and it meant a lot to him that you could flourish in a time of drought if your roots are deep. We used to do as a family what's called a rimmer, rim to rim to rim. We would drive to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, hike all the way down to the Colorado River, and then all the way up the south rim, and turn around and go back down by another trail to the Colorado River, and back up the Colorado River. And we used to do that as a family. So they wanted to do the three of them as adults. And they did this very recently. But Laura made that a special trip. I asked them if they'd be my spiritual messengers on their hike. I crushed some red rock to give to Anne Marie. I told Anne Marie, your red rock symbolizes anger, and I'm ready to get rid of it. Would you please throw it in the river for me? And if you have any of your own, you can toss it in too. <laughs> for Sarah, I gave her white rock that symbolizes fear. She was to throw that in the river because I didn't need to be afraid anymore. The gray rock was sadness and depression and asked Paul, too, to throw it in the river. She was very open with us and the messages she'd written, how she wanted to, I think, achieve a, a healthier freedom for herself. Sometimes I feel helpless with my mom's sickness, not knowing what I can do to help her. This was a way that she invited us to be a part of her healing process. It felt like she was with us. There are a lot of gifts with cancer. It teaches you to appreciate each moment you're given. You see in a way that you don't often see before because you think you've got forever. It helps me to really enjoy the life I have today. And that's all that any of us can do. After much troubling discussion with his wife and family, and against all advice from his lawyer, Dr. Cornett refused to settle. In the course of a complaint filed with the Commission des Normes du Travail, McGill University was ordered to pay $5,000 to Dr. Cornett for an inadequate termination notice. Still, he continues his legal pursuit against McGill. I think constantly we have this quest to find the right life. And once you found it, you don't want it changed. It's very comfortable then. However, the reality is that life changes. It changes constantly. It changes all the time, and it's a lie to believe that things won't change or that they shouldn't change. That's the tougher one to accept. Je constate le changement, que les choses ne sont plus pareilles. All I can do is tell you what I told Jack with a long, long towel. Because rhyming is hard enough in English, c'est plus difficile en français. 
Alors, les gens qui font ça sont sûrement totalement fous ou complètement crazy. C'est l'introduction spécialement pour le Festival de Jazz Montréal de Pull My Daisy. Pull my daisy, tip my cup. All my doors are open. In years to come, when I'll think of my university years, I'll think a lot about my friends, a lot of about the things that we did and the, and the, um, you know all the the nights that we spent at the cafe talking and discussing about so many interesting subjects but also and mostly I'll think about that last class that I took with Dr. Cornett. Hopefully Dr. Cornett will live long and, and old <laughs> and so we'll keep up the dialogue. A story to tell Monsieur le Dr. Norman Cornette. He's definitely your best bet. He puts religion and music too. For all of you, because the arts and the sciences relate, don't you know? Alors, il n'y a pas plus, I gotta say, on va écouter Norman play. <laughs> Now you've done another concerto. Yeah, for piano. You're writing a piano concerto yeah. now. In what vein? Desperation. <laughs> <laughs> trying, to, trying to get it finished and have it be good. Do you have any piano concertos already in your repertoire? Just, just the piano sonata. The sonata. And a lot of chamber music. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's different. Oh, well, that's awesome. Oh, it's fun. To tackle a piano concerto at this stage in the career. That means yeah. you never surrender, as they say in rock. <laughs> well, you do. You surrender yourself at a very early age to music and all that that implies. Yeah. And wow. that takes you every day in all over the world, places mm -hmm. you've never been, mm -hmm. things you never do. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing is just to Try and be terrific every minute, every day, all the time, everywhere. And let other people worry about careers and all that junk. Just figure you're going to be five times better than you're expected to be. And just get pleasure if you can do something really well. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs>